Welcome to another episode of the Feature Presentation Podcast, where every week we take a deep dive into the trenches of independent filmmaking. I'm your host, Derek Diamond, and this week I'm happy to be joined with my guest, Ms. Jennifer Castle. Jennifer, how are you this morning? I'm very well, thank you. It's a beautiful sunny day here in London. I guess I should clarify, it's morning for me, it just turned afternoon for you, so it's the time difference is a little interesting, but yeah, it's like I was saying to you before we started, you know, I'm usually up by 4.30, 5 anyway, because I've started taking my dog out for walks every morning, and she just wants to go out a little bit earlier every morning, so usually she wakes up and she's all like ready to go and everything, so all good. Fantastic. Yeah, I'm lucky to have a dog as well. And as the weather's getting warmer, I'm also trying to walk him early and late and all that, you know, get him nice and tired so he doesn't go crazy in the afternoons. Yeah, no, I have that exact same philosophy. If it's <laughs> if it cools off enough during the evening, I'll take her out. But it's usually early morning because it's so humid and hot here this time of year. Yeah. Do you Don't find wanna... it's keeping you nice and fit? Uh. Not as much as I would like it to, but it's <laughs> it's it's better than nothing. I'll say that, yeah. especially when she sees something that she wants to chase after so that it becomes a, oh. a little bit of an arm workout. But <laughs> it's all good. All good. So I, I wanted to get started with our conversation with uh, getting a bit, little bit of your background. So what was it that initially made you want to become an actor? In all honesty, I wish I could pinpoint the exact time, but I've just always always loved acting ever since I was little I've always been sort of theatrical I've always found films theater tv I've just found it fascinating I was a big reader as a child as well and I would always visualize what what was going on in the books I was reading and putting myself in the place of the characters and all that kind of stuff and I just started when I was a child auditioning for school plays adored it loved it um, when I graduated high school, I applied for the drama schools here in London. I was lucky enough to uh, land a place on the foundation course at uh, the London Academy of Dramatic Art. And then after a year there, I got into the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art to do the full course there. So I got classically trained at uh, we, RADA, we call it. And uh, after I graduated in 2005, I've been acting ever since. That's fantastic. What is what is the what is the filmmaking and the theater scene like over in London? Because, you know, I, I, one of the things I love about doing the show is talking with people who come from different countries or even different parts of the country and hearing you know the differences that there are from from where I live. So uh, what 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 is the filmmaking scene like over in London? Booming, in a word. It's absolutely fantastic over here. Uh, the UK offer really good tax breaks and things like that. So all of the companies like Netflix and Disney and all that, they love making films over here, which is great for us. Um, I think uh, Pinewood Studios, for example, is now booked up until something like 2027 with films. So even if you want to make a film at Pinewood, you have to wait because there are so many slated to get going. It's, it's been magnificent. In terms of theatre, I imagine it's very much like the States. So we have the West End, which is like Broadway, uh, and that's the kind of cream of the crop. And then, and then we have um, all of the local theatres and things like that. And uh, there's always something going on. Uh, regionally, I think it's a bit harder. So I think you'll find, again, like with the States, you know, most actors will either move to New York or LA. I think a lot of people gravitate to London because this is really sort of the place to be. Kind of like the, I don't want to say the hub point, but, you know, it's like when people think of filmmaking in the States, your mind yeah. automatically goes to Los Angeles. Right, Hollywood, exactly. And I think here we think things like Pinewood Studios, where you have the James Bond stage and all that kind of thing. So yeah, we have we have Pinewood and a lot of stuff goes on there. And then of course, locally, they film a lot around London as well. And it's the same for TV. Yeah, and it, the great thing about, you know, and I, I can't fully speak for, for London, but one of the cool mm. things about the, advent, the invention of new technologies like the iPhone and it being more accessible, you see films being shot, you know, like in here, Atlanta is huge and New Orleans yeah. is huge. And you know, I've talked with filmmakers who live in, you know, Memphis, Tennessee or in the Midwest or the Pacific Northwest. So that that's one thing that's been really cool to see as as I've grown up, you know, because in growing up as a kid, you're like, oh, you got to go out to L.A. or maybe New York if you want to be a filmmaker. Oh, but but now absolutely. you can you can do it anywhere. 
Oh, yeah, completely. I mean, we have some fantastic stuff coming out of Scotland and Ireland. And um, there's this absolutely brilliant, there's this little island called the Isle of Man, which has even better tax breaks than everywhere else. And fortunately, even though it's a little pinpoint of an, an island, it has all the different geographical places that you would need. So we've got rocky beaches and we've got fields and we've got swamp. So no matter what you're filming, you can pack your crew onto a tiny little plane and zoom over to this island, which is a little bit like going back in time 20 years, you know, because it takes a while for everything to catch up. And then you can, you can, you can film your stuff on a budget and present it to the world and no one will ever know that you filmed it you know on this tiny little prick in the middle of nowhere <laughs> but that's what's great though is finding locations like that that can fit all of your needs and if you have it mm -hmm. then you know why not use it yeah absolutely although uh have you seen the film elvis uh not yet i really want to though yeah well of course a lot of it takes place in in memphis there were definitely some bits there because it's a Baz Luhrmann film. I was looking at it and thinking, hmm, that looks an awful lot like the Australian Outback to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Australia's big too. You know, the, the new Thor movie was entirely filmed oh, in Australia yes. too. So saw it last night, enjoyed it very much. Yep, I, I saw it uh, Thursday night and it was, yeah, it was fun. It's, it's probably not for everyone, but, you know, it's... It's like most Marvel movies. If you if you like the MCU, if you like Thor, you'll like it. If not, you probably won't. But I had Absolutely. fun watching it. Yeah. So, so growing up, what were some of your, your favorite films? Because I, I've been kind of immersing myself in the different films of different cultures. You know, like I'm kind of going through like a mm -hmm. Japanese film phase right now. Oh, yes. So so what so what were what were some of your favorite films growing up? I mean, definitely the one, you know, we all have the Disney film that, that as soon as you say it's your favorite Disney film, people can pinpoint your age. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, mine was Aladdin because I was at the perfect age to love Disney films when Aladdin came out and I thought it was just magical and wonderful. And to this day, I can probably sing you three quarters of the songs off the top of my head without even having to think about it. So, uh, of course, you know, the Disney films as a kid, um, I'm almost sad that they're remaking them all as live action now because I'm like, what was wrong with the way they were? I'm a bit kind of old lady shouting at clouds about that. You know, I'm like, I don't want progress. I want it to stay the same. <laughs> so I loved that. And another film that I will always remember as just being something that really struck a chord with me was A League of Their Own which is about the Women's Baseball League in World War II, which seems like such a strange thing for a little English girl to be taken with. But it was it was just, it was so inspirational as a child, back in a time when there weren't really that many movies about women for women, you know? It was mostly, mostly men were the lead when I was growing up as a child. And there was something about that film. I think I went and saw it about eight times at the cinema. Wow. When I was a teenager. And I, I even I even bought a baseball bat and sort of started making my parents throw balls for me in the garden so I could pretend to be Gina Davis. Yeah. So that, that film was amazing. And it's probably one of about three sports films I've actually enjoyed because I am frankly not really a fan of physical activity. That's understandable. No, it's, it's <laughs> I, I, it, sports movies are very much an acquired taste. Like, there are some that I mm -hmm. like, and there are some that I that I find kind of boring. But it's it's funny you yeah. mention that because Aladdin's my favorite Disney film as well. Really? Yep. We must be similar ages. We won't tell anyone. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah, because uh, I, I remember very vividly going to the theater. You know, there, there are certain mm -hmm. movies that anybody who wants to get into film, they have those memories of like yeah. certain films that you know it's like you can remember the smell of the theater the look of yes. it that's how i am with with aladdin and a few other movies that i saw around that time frame but Definitely. yeah it's like that that was the golden age of disney films between that the lion king and several others it was like yep. disney was untouchable at that oh, time yeah yeah but yeah. yeah, and 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 looking back, it's it is it's it's an era. It's like a little snapshot of childhood that you you can look back on and think, yeah, we were mm -hmm. lucky. We were yep. so lucky. Absolutely. So once once you go through university and you go through you know yeah. your your education and everything, yeah. how do you how do you get your foot in the door of actually starting acting as a career? 
and you work, 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 and work. You take absolutely everything you can, even if it's a profit share in a grubby room above a pub somewhere. You just you just plug away and you get as much experience as you can, and then hopefully someday you'll be lucky, because. Uh, as as I'm sure it is in the States and other countries as well, quite a lot of the UK industry works on nepotism. Uh, so um, if you don't really know anyone in the industry, if you don't have a, a godparent or a parent, it can be quite tough. So you just you have to plug away and you have to um, keep faith in yourself and, and take what you can. And if you're lucky um, and you show people that you're good at what you do, they'll remember you and they'll bring you back and eventually you'll work your way up the ladder. And it's exactly how it is here. You know, it, it's, yeah. it's finding that little crack mm-hmm. in the door. You know, people say, get your foot in the door. I yeah. say you have to find a crack in the door. Yes. To, to find right. you know, <laughs> to even get your foot there. Yeah. yeah. Cause you, you have to find somebody that is also willing to say that they know you that's willing yeah. to, I don't want to say state their reputation because I think that's a little extreme, but Someone to say, oh, well, I know so-and-so. I think they'd be a great fit for, for this project. It's Whether it's game. acting, it's the same way with working behind the camera. You know, starting out, you know, I, I worked as a grip, you know, on set mm. uh, with a short right. film here over the weekend. And yeah, it's it's long hours, but you can also learn from the DP. You can learn from the audio guy. You can learn from really anybody if you choose to. Absolutely. I've been doing this for nearly 20 years and I still learn something new every time. And I'm always asking questions. I must annoy the crew so much, but I'm constantly like, what's that for? What does that do? Why is this happening? You know, just because I, I find it fascinating. And also, I every single time I feel more confident when I know exactly what's happening. I still remember my first film um, after graduation was a film called Miss Potter. It was about Beatrix Potter with Renee Zellweger and Ewan McGregor. And I just, I just remember showing up on set and there's, it's such a different atmosphere from actually going to classes and, and trying all this stuff. And I just stood there as all these people were rushing around me and nobody sort of was saying what was going on because everyone, I don't know, it's like a well-oiled machine, isn't it? A film set, everyone has their thing and they're all just, you know, getting on with it. And, and you are sort of standing there going, I have no idea. What, what's going on and then suddenly they're like right you stand there okay let's let's rehearse quickly and the next thing you know you're doing it and you're like well this isn't like a play this isn't where everyone sits around to block the scene you're just you're doing it and I was so I was you know terrified in a way but now of course you know bit by bit I've learned why everyone is rushing around what they're doing where they're going and I feel more confident in my ability to do my job and my bit and uh, and I find it exhilarating I find that classes are great in laying the foundation, mm. but mm. you can't replicate actually learning on the job. Like you said, I remember the first set that I worked on. Everybody's just kind of <laughs> doing their own thing. And you're just like, uh, what, what What do yeah. I do? Like you're just standing there like, I don't know what to do with my hands kind of thing. But once yeah, you. Nothing once you, beats experience. Yeah. Once you dive in and fully experience it and you, yeah, you might stumble a couple of times, but that happens with everybody. Oh, sure. Yeah. It's, I, I, as, as long as you acknowledge it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I use this analogy quite a bit is that a, a film is like a giant machine and everyone mm-hmm. from the director all the way down to the PAs are cogs in the machine and they all yeah. have to work together in order to get the machine to run. Yeah, absolutely. It, it, it can and, be. And, go on. Sorry. Uh, I was just going to say it, it, it can be very fascinating to watch, Mm. you know, the different departments do what they do and then think of how it pertains to the bigger picture. Yes, definitely. And I find uh, what's fascinating is the the protocols involved in that everyone is is extremely polite on film sets, which you wouldn't think because everyone's uh, rushing and busy and probably a bit stressed. But because everybody knows exactly what their job is and why they're doing it and how to do it, everybody is respectful of everybody else's job as well. You know, so it's, you know, if 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 the first AD is saying, how long is it going to take? And the grips say, it's going to take five minutes. They never go, oh, come on, guys, can you not do it faster? They're like, nope, it's going to take five minutes. And the AD knows that, and they would never disrespect them by saying, can you hurry it up, ever? You know, mm-hmm. I, I find that absolutely fascinating that in such a high-pressure environment, 
everyone can stay so calm. Although, of course, it always trickles down from the top, doesn't it? That is very true. And I, I, I use this analogy as well is that, you know, it's uh, I thought you br bringing up that point was great about the AD saying, how long is it going to take? The grip says five minutes. Yeah. You're working on a movie and you shouldn't yeah. be a jerk to others because like <laughs> you said, it trickles down because, you know, I, I yeah. hear these stories about people freaking out on sets and everything. But I'm like, you're getting to make a movie for a living like you should. It, it's it's a privilege. Yes. that you're doing that so and you're on set for 12 plus hours the last thing you want is drama and you know arguments and bad behavior yeah it's it is a grind i think one of my favorite things is when a newbie shows up on a shoot and they've never done it before and they're all excited and they're they're, they're so like looking forward to the glamour and the glitz and by the end of the day you just see them and the poor things look so <laughs> shell shocked <laughs> And you want to say, yeah, unfortunately, only the end product is glamorous. The actual making of the movie is jolly hard work. You just feel the the energy and the excitement just get sucked, <laughs> sucked right out of them. Yeah, poor things. Yeah, but it's also how you find out if it's for you. If you're, That's very true. If you're emotionally drained and you're like, well, maybe this isn't for me. But yep, I, definitely. but I, but I also credit people who attempt it. And then if it's not what they want to do, then you can say, yeah, I tried it. It wasn't what I thought it was. It's not for me. So understandable. Yes, that takes guts actually. Mm -hmm. For sure. I admire people like that too. And I sometimes, goodness knows, there are times when I've wished there was something else I'd want to do as well. I think, why am I doing this? Oh, but I always love it. When it's over, I always love it. Yeah. Yeah. Same for me. So let's talk about Ricky the Rhino, which is an animated film that you actually provided the voice of the main character, Ricky the Rhino. Um, how did you initially hear about this and uh, what made you want to get involved? Because the film was actually made, uh, if I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, but in Indonesia in early 2020. And now it's right. getting a more international release. So how did you get involved with the project? Well, this was a really interesting one, actually, because, uh, as you said, it's an Indonesian film. They made it to highlight the plight of the uh, Indonesian rhinoceros, which is extremely endangered. I think it's absolutely brilliant that they've done this, and I think it's a great film. But what happened was uh, they recorded all the Indonesian voices, and they did do an English dub. But when the distributors here in the UK got it, they realized that the dub wasn't quite up to the right quality that they needed in order to stream it here. So they needed to do a very, very quick recording with new voices so that they could release it on time. And I happened, um, I, I was already acquainted with the distributors. And so they, they literally just offered me the part. I, I didn't audition for it. They just said, can you do it? And I said, oh, yeah. Why not? You know, uh, so they uh, they only re-recorded for the English release, uh, Ricky and his friend Benny the Duck, who was voiced by the fantastic Paul Reynolds, who I again was I already am friends with Paul. So we, we got to work together for the first time on this and we recorded the entire thing in two days. In a small studio in East London. <laughs> That's insane to think about. It was <laughs> two, crazy. Two days. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was going to ask if that's actually possible, but you did it. <laughs> yes. So it, it is. But it, so did they tell you up front that you had two days to do it? Well, we were going to try and do it in one. Uh, <laughs> but we had to admit defeats. Even we couldn't manage that. Um, it, it, it really was... Um, uh, an, an, an incredible couple of days uh, we, so we had I think our sound engineer I, honestly it was somewhere in Europe he wasn't even in England uh, the day before he, he just got a train from somewhere like Germany or something <laughs> and came down so we had him we had the director and we had the two actors and uh, uh, Paul and I would actually because it was so intense we'd often take turns going into the booth and so one of us would do some some work and then take a rest while the other one went in. And uh, and then we'd uh, we'd grab a pizza and we'd have a quick lunch break and then we'd just get back in there and do it. And it was it was crazy, but it was really fun. How did you prepare for a role when you have just two days to to actually record the dialogue? Well, I had a 
a look at the breakdown of, of the character and I had a look at the sort of things I would have to do. And I knew obviously that it was a little boy. So I did a, a little a little bit of quick research online, just, just listening to various cartoon characters. You know, obviously Bart Simpson is famously voiced by Nancy Cartwright. And, you know, and and boy characters are often voiced by women because actual boys tend to grow up and their voices go a bit funny. So uh, I listened to that and then I, uh, I, I chose the kind of uh, voice that I wanted for Ricky, who's obviously, uh, he's, uh, how can I put it? He, uh, he's determined um, and he, uh, he's, He's got his like little um, superhero powers that he collects throughout the day. So I, I knew that I'd have to do a sort of a lot of like, oh, ah, ah, as, as he moved and all that kind of stuff. So I had to pick the right pitch for my voice and I, I picked it. And then I basically uh, ran through a few bits of it with the director to kind of say, is this, does this sound okay? And he was like, yeah, yeah, sounds good. So when we were doing the actual recording, it mostly, I mostly sort of, just managed to maintain what I was doing. Occasionally I'd get a bit excited and, and my, my pitch would go up and things like that. And he'd just sort of go, bit more boy, a little, little bit more boy. And I'd be like, oh, right, yeah, okay, let's re-record that. And, uh, and that's how we did it. That's so fascinating because, you know, like <laughs> I, I know that here locally every now and then we'll do like a 48 hour film project where you have to write mm -hmm. shoot and edit a film in two days, but you never hear yeah. from like a, a feature you know, linked film or an animated film. You're like, oh, you've got two days to do this. It's just, it's, you, it's mind blowing. No, the engineers were the superheroes, really. I mean, luckily with, with Ricky, uh, a lot of my dialogue was things like running noises and fighting noises and things like that. So we didn't have to, to do too many takes of those kinds of things. But it, it was, um, it was baptism by fire because it was my first feature um, voiceover job really you know i've done smaller i've done smaller ones but this was my first ever feature film full length so i really really enjoyed myself great way to get introduced to it yeah i'll say <laughs> everything else will be a cakewalk after this <laughs> yeah exactly uh, you said you've done a little bit of, of voice work before doing mm -hmm. ricky the rhino your first feature uh, how was yeah. the transition from acting like on a set to then going into a sound booth, are there any major differences? Any, yeah, you know, I don't want to say struggles that you might have had, but what were some of the major differences between acting for camera and acting for voiceover? Well, yeah, when you're acting for camera, of course, um, it's different from stage work in that when you're acting for camera, you have to do everything a lot smaller anyway. You'll usually have a, a mic pack or somebody with a boom above your head, so you know that you can just do your do your acting and not worry about it. When you're doing voice recording, of course, you've got this enormous sensitive microphone in front of you and it picks up absolutely everything. And when, you, when you've got a voice like mine, when you go, pa, 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 you'll take off somebody's eardrums if you're not careful. So um, I definitely did find myself um, learning a few times when doing things that I was, you know, I had to talk over the mic rather than directly into the mic and around the mic and for things, especially for things like the fighting noises and stuff like that, it was a lot more technical because I was trying to give a performance and, and do all the emotional work that I needed to do while staying as technical as possible. Whereas normally when I'm acting, I have a little bit more freedom because they work around me well, the microphone wasn't going to move around just because I wanted it to, <laughs> you know, I, I had to stay still. So I found that very, very difficult, but I'm glad that I had the chance to, to practice that. Watching voice actors, you perform in a sound booth is also very fascinating to me. Yeah. And we, we were talking about Aladdin, Robin Williams, watching footage of him doing the voice work for the genie and just you know, being his boisterous self and just throwing yeah. his hands out as he's saying the lines for genie is just it's it's awesome but you know, yes I, i've taken a couple of acting classes and i've realized mm -hmm. that it's not entirely for me but i mm -hmm. i something on my bucket list to do actually in in the film business is do voiceover work for some type of character so that, i think that'd be fun 
yeah I, I definitely a few times I think I threw my arms out and I actually ended up ruining the entire take because you could hear you know the rustling of my clothes or something like that and I was just like oh that would have been a really great one if it weren't just for the technicalities I'm hampered I'm hampered by all of these mortal things uh the darn technology and technicalities <laughs> it's all too sensitive these days that's the I, problem I know right <laughs> So what's next for you? Do you have any other uh, projects, whether it's live action or voice work in the future? I've been delightfully busy right now. I've uh, been doing a mixture of feature film and TV stuff. I've, uh, I had a, a lovely little role in an ITV drama called Trigger Point, uh, which is a, a very exciting drama um, about some bombings that take place during uh, a very hot summer in London. I had a great time filming that because, of course, we filmed it a few months beforehand in the freezing cold. So there they are painting sunburn onto me and I'm wearing, you know, sort of like a tank top and I'm absolutely shivering in between takes going, someone bring me a blanket, please. But that was that was really fun to do. Um, and I've also been filming a, a period drama that uh, hopefully will be coming to the big screens next year. I can't talk too much about it, but that's great fun. And at the moment, uh, Netflix is streaming a fantastic uh, comedy called Motherland, uh, where I play one of the alpha mums who makes the main character feel utterly inadequate, which uh, I must say was quite evilly fun to film. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. So I'll have to check that out. That actually sounds really interesting. Please do. Yeah, for sure. Uh, what is one piece of advice that you would give to an aspiring actor? I would say don't turn anything down. Just uh, do absolutely everything you can because you will learn something from every job you do, no matter what. Even if you think, oh, this will never get me anywhere, it will because you will learn something. Uh, that's great advice. What's your favorite movie of all time? Oh my goodness, you can't ask me that. That's that's not possible because it depends on my day, on my mood. But go on. If you say, should we watch A League of Their Own? I will put down everything to watch it. And a close second is Back to the Future because it's a great film. Back to the Future is one of those few movies that I consider in the perfect category. Like I wouldn't change Absolutely. a single thing about it. The acting's perfect. The script is wonderful. The <laughs> sound The soundtrack is almost its own character in the movie, which yep. I love. It's very much a product of its time. It's also on my high on my list of movies that should never be remade. Yes. There isn't a single thing you could change about it that would improve it. It's just perfect. Mm -hmm. And no, if I, if I turn the telly on and it's on that, that's it. That's me for the day. I, <laughs> nothing else will get done. You got me wanting to watch that movie. I haven't watched back to the future, yeah. in forever, <laughs> but no, it's, it's, it's such a, it's such a wonderful movie. <laughs> yeah, it really is. And I'm, I'm glad I reminded you of it. Yeah, no, it's great. Uh, do you have any <laughs> website or social media you'd like to plug so the viewers and listeners can follow you? Yeah, sure. Look me up on Facebook and Instagram. I'm on both of those. And of course, I have a lovely IMDb profile. So do go for that. Fantastic. Well, Jennifer, thank you so much for taking the time to have this chat with me. This was great. Thank you for having me. I had a lovely time. If you'd like to subscribe to the show, just head over to linktree.com slash featurepresspod. You can find all the podcast subscription information as well as social media. And don't forget, we are live every Monday night on YouTube at 8 p.m. Central Time. Just search for Feature Presentation on YouTube, and we will be back live next Monday at 8 p.m. That's going to do it for this week's show, so enjoy the rest of your week, and be sure to come back next week for another fun episode of Feature Presentation with Derek Diamond.